Welcome, welcome, welcome to Vintage and Stuff. I'm your host, Drew Heifetz, the show where we unearth the wild, wacky, and occasionally questionable world of vintage clothing and the people behind it. In each episode, we'll be chatting with vintage sellers who have dedicated their lives to hunting down the most eccentric, eye-popping garments you can imagine. From shoulder pads big enough to double as umbrellas to psychedelic patterns that can induce flashbacks, even if you weren't alive in the 60s, will leave no polyester stone unturned. Get ready for outrageous stories of thrift store conquests, the art of deciphering retro fashion trends, and the inevitable moments of head-scratching confusion when they stumble upon an item that seems to defy all logic. Who knew that combining neon colors, animal prints, and oversized bows was a good idea at some point? But fear not, dear listeners. We'll also dive into the genuinely fabulous side of vintage fashion, We'll explore the cultural significance of iconic garments, discover craftsmanship that has stood the test of time, and learn how to rock a vintage look without looking like a walking time capsule. Although sometimes you just might. So grab your most extravagant hat, dust off those disco boots, and join us on this hilarious, informative, and sometimes downright bizarre journey through vintage fashion. Welcome to Vintage and Stuff, where we keep the fashion weird and wonderful. Okay, <laughs> you're wondering what the hell's going on. Yes, I had ChatGPT write me an intro to the show. What do you guys think? A lot of disco and polyester talk in there, not so relevant, but guess what? We did it anyway. <laughs> Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Not sure I'll be running with that on a daily basis, but hey, we're having some fun with the AI lately. Have you guys had fun with AI lately? Let me know down below if you've been messing with AI and what you've been able to do with it. Put it in the comments. I'm, this is the contest today. I'm gonna to pick my best answer about what you've done with AI, and I'm gonna give you $100 store credit to fasinfrankvintage.com. Okay, enough about that. Let's talk about today's guest, Zip Stevenson. He is the owner of Hollywood Trading Co., a very high-end denim and leather store in Hollywood, among other things. He's also the owner of the Denim Doctors business, which is a very high-end denim repair business, again, in Hollywood, run out of the same facility. He also has his own line of vintage um, inspired fashion called Stevenson Overalls. We get into all that. He's also a regular at the Rose Bowl. I've been seeing this man out there shopping vintage denim and leather specifically for 20 years now. And um, yeah, it's a great chat. He's also part owner of the $76,000 jeans. I know part owner sounds weird, but that's how the story went. We'll get into that on this episode as well. Uh, he just had a long, uh, colorful life in the vintage game and a, a great interview and a great talk. So, so buckle your seatbelts and get ready for a good one. Again, if you've been listening for a while, you know that this is the free 45-minute version. We're now offering a free seven-day trial on the Patreon. That is free. You heard it right. Free, 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 free seven-day trial on the Patreon, which gets you access to the full two-hour episodes. Every episode is usually at least two hours long, and we only post 45 minutes here for free. Also, you can just join my YouTube channel. You can sub right on YouTube and pay here and get the full two-hour video here as well. So that's it. This is the, this is the free 45-minute version. If you want the two-hour episode, you jump on the free seven-day trial on the Patreon, or you can pay here on YouTube. Click join down below and get it here. No more BS talk. Let's jump into it. Welcome to the show, my friend. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, first question I had is, is your, is your real name Zip? Or is this like a nickname? I've, asked, I've been asked that question 10,000 times probably throughout my life. But uh, yeah, okay. my parents were hippies and uh, I was born in 1968. And that was kind of a thing to do at the time is to give your kids kind of trippy jazzy names and so that's what i got i have two uh two siblings with hippie names as well so yeah what are the, what are those names can you divulge yeah well one of them changed it but they started off with uh sun s-u-n like sun in the sky and then star like star yeah. starlight star bright uh star kept his name it became by the time it became a concern for him he uh it became cool to have oh your parents are cool uh they're not you know squares so he kept it, but my other yeah. brother, uh, the one, the middle brother, he changed it to Scott because he was just getting a lot of flack for having a interesting name, let's say. So, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, my dad had a nickname. His he had a nickname Zip in high school. Jesus, Zip wow. Man, they called him. Yeah, I've but his I've name's so Dave actually through Facebook. You can kind of find people with really unusual names and so there's like seven of us i think out in the world and i've reached out to a couple of them saying so what's the story with your name i none of them have said oh i was born with it on my birth certificate most of them said yeah it's a nickname but it be, it became the my name so most people don't know what my real name is they just accept that it it's zip so they don't they don't know that so I like to joke that my name is one in a million, but it's probably like one in 30 million, one in 40 million. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's great, yeah. man. I've never, I never questioned it until I started to write it down today, but um, that's cool, man. Yeah. So, you know, quick little intro here. You, I know you from the Rose Bowl. I've known you from many years of cruising the Rose Bowl, buying up vintage denim and vintage leather goods. That sounds right. Um, I've seen you at all the different events. I think you were probably at the first Rose Bowl buying from us when we did it in about 2006, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I feel like I remember you from the very first round. Um, that, that could be. That could very well be. I started in. Uh, I started going to the markets in '94. Uh, okay. And I got in the. I started working for a guy in '93, and then about a year later, I opened up my own place, and the rest is history. Let's say. So yeah, give us give us the rundown on that. So ninety three, you worked for another vintage dealer. Is that what it was? Uh, yeah, he wasn't really a dealer per se. He had a retail store. He was getting all his jeans from the I think the Salvation Army up in San Jose area. He had a really uh, sweet contract to get anything. I think any Levi's with buttons on them, he'd get them for. I think if there was no problems with them, they were like five dollars a pair. And, they had any problem at all, even like a broken belt loop, it'd be like a dollar a pair or something like that. So, yeah. um, and then he was retailing them at the time for thirty nine ninety five, I think. And what intrigued me about the situation is that there was a store a couple doors down that's selling brand new Levi's from the Levi company, and those were selling for thirty five dollars a pair. And it kind of blew me away like wow this guy's charging more for used levi's than new and i had grown up uh with the understanding that things are secondhand are always cheaper than new as a rule and this was the first yeah. time i had ever seen secondhand clothing selling for more than brand new clothing and uh this is in the again 93 to 94 before all the factories started doing really good washes on jeans so you either had very dark, rigid, uh, unwashed the 000 model or the rinsed 0115 model. Or there was another model. I forgot what the model number is, but it was basically like a mom jean, which is like this really kind of uh, washed out jean where it's the colors uniform throughout the whole jean. Kind of like, again, like we call them a mom jean or like Obama jeans or something. Uh, so if you wanted something with a pretty fade and pretty washed, the only way you could get that is uh, second hand. So that's yeah. that's interesting because you look back, you know, through the 80s or early yeah. 90s with denim, you see like acid washes or light washes or different color tones. But what you're referring to is more like the the manipulated wear wear, the hige or like that that pre kind yeah of wash, this right? pre pre yeah pre fake vintage used wash right exactly 
So, of course, over the years, people got better and better at it. I think, as I recall, Diesel was maybe the first company that I remember doing an, uh, a pretty wash to jeans. There might have been other people, but that's the one I remember. And then, yeah, they, they, and and they started also in vintage, did they not? Oh, I don't Diesel? know. I haven't. I didn't. I don't know if I know that. I mean, Adriana I, I've heard the story that they were also in leather goods, and they were buying a lot of vintage belts. And I think they originally started in vintage and then moved on. But you know, I would say, as far as I remember too, that was one of the first brands kind of going down that road. Yeah, in a, in a, Adriana Goldschmidt shows up at the Rollsville from time to time. I'll have to ask him. He'll, he'll definitely know because he was there at the very beginning. So he's a That's great, cool. he's so a yeah, great, talk- he's a great guy to interview, by the way, if you haven't had the chance. So, okay. Yeah. I'll take that. I'll do it. Did you, you mentioned like you had your own store after that. So what in, in 94, when you opened your own store, was this in Hollywood? What was the store called? Um, I guess it was, it's close to Hollywood. It was called Ragtime Vintage and Denim. And it was, okay. it, it had that name because we inherited a store from a previous owner who sold, uh, use clothing, not really jeans, but just general vintage clothing like cashmere sweaters and uh, polka dot dresses and that kind of stuff. And uh, that that person, uh, he when I I huh, how I met her is uh, I was trying to make a side hustle, having a side hustle. So working at this uh, retail store in Santa Monica. And then as a side hustle, I would sell vintage overalls that I'd find at the flea markets and buying them for like 10 to $12 a pair and then selling them for 20 and then reach, they would retail for like $40 for a nice faded uh, Dickies overall or something like that. So one, yeah. day, one day I went to a store, a vintage store, and said, hey, I have a bunch of great vintage uh, overalls. I wonder if you'd be interested in carrying them. She said, that's a great idea, but I'm getting rid of my store. I'm going to either sell it or close it. I'm, I'm transitioned to a different kind of business. And so I said, okay, well, no problem. Just hold my number. And if when the new people come in, please pass my number to them. And I'd love to talk to them about it. She said, yeah, sure. Sounds good. And then I think a month later, I, I followed up. She said, yeah, I was in escrow to sell, but it fell through. And now I'm going to just close the store because I need to move on. And so with that... I offered her ten grand to buy her store, and basically it was just getting the, her inventory, which I didn't really need too much, but it was just a place to start from, and and taking the clients that she had built up over the years. So yeah, for ten for ten thousand dollars, I I got in the business. So That's, from yes, yeah. where where do you say this location was? This was on Third Street, very close to the Grove Mall in Los Angeles. So, oh yeah, uh, yeah, between, which is close to where you are right now, right? Uh, I'm actually much closer to downtown uh, LA, actually on on Beverly Boulevard, but very close to downtown. So just okay. just west of downtown. So, I've moved around many, many. Yeah, I've moved around many, many times. It's always been in the context of some real estate situation. So this is, I think, my one, two, three. This is my fourth commercial building that I bought and sold. So. Oh, nice. Good yeah. for you. Yeah, that's definitely the way to so, do it if you can. You said, uh, yeah, I want to talk about that more. We'll talk. We'll mm-hmm. jump into that later on. Sure, sure. You know, I want to talk about early days. You say like you were at the markets 93, 94, and you're still at the markets today. That's 30 years, 30 years, almost yeah. 30 years at yeah. the markets. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, True. You know, talk about the Rose Bowl a bit because that's where I know you from. That's where probably a lot of people know you from. How is it? How was it back then? And like, how has it changed? I, and, I remember, you know, I remember going to the Rose Bowl even before I started working in secondhand clothing. Going to the Rose Bowl flea market, and again, this was thirty years ago. Walking across the river area, that that kind of storm drainage thing. And it was like five yeah. or six dealers at the time. There wasn't very many dealers at all. It's basically an empty parking lot with five or six dealers selling clothing, selling used clothing. And it became known as the secondhand clothing area, the white section. And there was a few guys there selling jeans. And I picked up a pair of jeans and I said, how much are these? And the guy said, 25. And I go, oh, cool. Do you have change for 40 bucks? And the guy goes, sir, 2,500, 2,500. And I, oh my God. And they must, I mean, 
I don't even remember what they were at the time, but they must have been like dead stock double X's or something like that, right? A leather patch, yeah. perfect, perfect leather patch or something like that, perfect size, etc. So yeah, he's a twenty five hundred, and that really got my attention, right? Like holy mackerel! So it was a combination of working at a second hand clothing store plus going to the Rolls Bowl, and before I was a dealer, going there and seeing that people could ask them the pricing for stuff, it kind of blew my mind. So and then yeah, I got the bug. Yeah. So I, you know, I guess like when you when you look at that and you look at. Your, the Rose Bowl has never, you know, sure, you can score at the Rose Bowl. And even back then, you probably could score a lot easier than you can now. But then also there was people that knew what they were doing. So you had to, like, find the stuff and learn what was, why that thing was worth $2,500, right? And then and then go and find it. So, like, yeah, how were you able to do that? How were you able to learn and then go and find it? There was dealers, you know, a lot of dealers were very secretive about uh what they had other dealers they were motivated to teach because they wanted me to bring them stuff and you know they'd rather teach me have me find it and sell to them and in the beginning i was doing that there was a guy named brandy kuba uh from american graffiti he's a really one of the very first guys in the business and i remember finding good jeans and supplying to him and it was surprising because at the time, Fake Alpha, the buyer from Fake Alpha, was coming pretty regularly. Uh, that was before the Burbage days. And I remember this guy would offer me, let's say, $1,000 for something. And Brandy would say, yeah, I can pay you $1,200. $1, so it really blew my mind that this American guy, whatever his connection was to stores in Japan, he was able to pay even more strongly than um, a vintage store from Japan. So, and at that time there wasn't, it wasn't 150 dealers coming. There was like five or six major dealers, like Fake Alpha was, was one of them that I remember. How, wh so why do you think he was paying more? He had a stronger customer base or I think he was so, able to yeah. curate better selection? I think I never, I never really understood, but my speculation is that he was selling to a few end user customers, people who would. I uh, read about him in some Japanese magazine, and they had reached out, and so he was directly communicating with them. This was really early on. This is before Facebook and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. So it was a course, lot yeah. harder, a lot harder to be connected to people uh, at that at, in those days. But yeah, for what it might have been also that he would think maybe let me overpay a little bit with this guy a few times to kind of get gain his trust and gain the access. And then I can, you know, start to buy them more reasonably where I actually have a margin where I can, where I can make it. So, and I, and I worked with him for like six months or a year or so. Um, and it was good for me. It was good for him. And then eventually he kind of slowed way, way down out of the business. I think he got a health, health problem or something. And then he just wasn't really active in the business anymore. So. Yeah. Do you remember, do you remember hearing about Green for Jeans? Or is that before I you? can't recall that name, no. Yeah, yeah, before my time. Yeah. So there was a handful of heavy-duty dealers. Drop Your Jeans, Rust uh, from Drop Your Jeans. He was one of the early ones. Um, Green for Jeans, Brandy. And there was a lot. Those other, like, dealers who have been out of business for 20 years that were in it, like guys from France who were coming in pretty regularly buying 501s and buying the Big E's and that kind of stuff. So, Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that memory of picking up the jeans and and I uh, see in the price tag of twenty five hundred dollars. I have a memory of you from Rose Bowl when I think you came into the booth and I had a grizzly jacket up on the wall or up on the tent and I wasn't in the booth at the time. I one of my like buddies was running the booth and you grabbed the jacket and you were like, I think he told you thirty five and then I come running back and I'm like, No, no, it's thirty five hundred and you were about to give him the thirty five bucks. Oh my and I was God. like, I just caught it before he hands you the thirty five or he hands you the jacket for thirty five bucks. Jesus. Um Jesus. Wow. so so yeah. That was a that was a good memory. Absolutely. I've had I've had those kind of those kind of deals still happen from time to time. I bought a jacket at a local flea market for 50 bucks and literally sold it the next day for $2,500. So there are still those random bargains that happen from time to time. Yeah. hundred percent. That's yeah. the game. You got to love yeah. when that happens. Absolutely. So question, what's the most you've ever 
purchase, besides, we know the $76,000 jeans. I want to talk about those later on in the episode. But besides that, what's the most you've ever paid for a garment of clothing? Um, wow. It might be this this pair I just bought in Japan, actually. I paid $8,000 really? for it. Yeah. I paid $8,000 for it, and I thought I got a smoking deal. <laughs> it's weird. It's weird, but yeah. So do you want to show it? Do you have it there right now? Yeah. While we're yeah, talking yeah. about it? Yep, yep, yep. I have it. One second. I got two crazy. So yeah, shoes. I mean, this is a, this is obviously a good segue here. We'll, we'll look at the jeans, and then we want to talk about uh, yeah your Japan trip. Quick intermission to the show, everybody. If you're liking what you're hearing, if you're excited to keep listening, don't waste any more time. Go jump on the Patreon for your seven day free trial. It's five dollars. After that, that is a dollar twenty five per episode. A dollar twenty-five for two hours of pure listening, joy, and education. So go jump on the Patreon, or you can join down below to the YouTube channel and listen right here on YouTube, or again on the Patreon, free seven-day trial. Also, guys, I never really talked that talk about wholesale on here, but F is in Frank is a wholesale company as well as a retail company. We have stores, but we also do wholesale. We have a warehouse in Toronto. We can supply most of what you need in the vintage world. We don't really wholesale a ton of hype vintage, but we do wholesale all your regular retail essentials. We also are currently wholesaling the Yeezy Gap unreleased season. If you guys want unreleased Yeezy Gap in your store, all you got to do is hit us up. Hit me up on the DMs, Drew Heifetz, or hit Jesse up, Jesse Heifetz on uh, Instagram. And we will sort you guys out with what you need. Maybe it's a fit for your business. So hit us up for wholesale. Okay, so so tell us about this. This is like, what era buckle back here? This is a 19, they call it the 1937 model. And that's when they started to offer them. They stopped selling them, I think, in 1941. Or I should say, Levi stopped selling them in 1941. They were still sitting on store shelves around the country. But Levi's like took it out of their catalog in 1941 when the World War II started. The, the government, the U.S. government sent out a memo to all the big companies saying uh, we can't use uh, extra threads and fabrics and stuff like that. So uh, they made Levi stop using the copper rivets on the, on the belt. They made Levi stop using copper rivets on the coin pocket. And even they asked Levi to stop putting the th decorative thread on the back pocket so levi started painting it during the war during world war ii so yeah so was it was it the war effort that that determined the buckle coming off in the yeah first place? yeah absolutely that's exactly i, the I actually never knew i didn't know that I, I knew like all the rations but i didn't know that it, it was also responsible for the buckle coming off that's interesting i I'm, levi would have done it anyway because uh in the beginning, Levi's made uh, 501s with no belt loops, no belt loops yeah. at all. And then they had this transitional period where they had belt loops and the buckle strap. And then they noticed people just weren't using the buckle straps or they're cutting them off. This is another pair here. And the buckle's been cut away. So um, at some point, people started cutting away the buckles and so it became redundant. So I think Levi would have removed it if uh if they weren't if they weren't directed by the government they would have been doing it anyway um, yeah so you brought these back from japan you went over there on a buying trip was it was it a trip solely for buying yeah yeah definitely definitely that was the and is this something you've been doing a while i have since the i think my first buying trip was like 98 or 99 something like that but yeah i've gone to japan probably 60 65 times something like that it's a uh, many many nice. many times yeah yeah that's amazing Jeez, it's it's uh there's like a funny thing they asked this bank robber why did he rob banks and he said well that's where the money is <laughs> so and I, I feel like it's the same thing like why do i go to japan to buy because that's where the stuff is you know so uh, and now the Japanese currency is so devalued. It's a it's an amazing time to buy. I, I checked today; the currency is uh, one forty to a dollar. So that's fantastic. That's a and what what deal. is it just for 
for context, because most people won't even be checking this, what was it at like when it's at sort of like a stable position? One, uh, probably 115. Yeah, 115. 115. Okay. So it's 25%, 25% devalued. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's a it, lot. This that's is an interesting lot. topic. Yeah. So that basically means for people that don't understand that is like you go with an American dollar, you're getting 25 cents extra on every dollar you spend, yeah. which makes things a lot more affordable. And, and you can buy, you could even buy dollar for dollar and still add the 25% profit when you bring it back. And this is a similar thing that me and Jesse have been doing for years because we're obviously buying in Canada and taking shit down to Rose Bowl and cashing in US dollar and then bringing it back to Canada and getting that exchange, right? So it's usually, is it usually it, a 20% spread? Is that typically what it is? I mean, it, it has gone as low as like 10, but so, right now it's at 35. So $1 American gets you $1.35. So yeah. I'm going to bo- boom up the Canadian vintage market right now by telling everyone they should come to Canada just like Zips going to Japan <laughs> and buy up all our vintage because you get 35% on your dollar. Seriously, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a game changer for me. And when I'm going to Japan as well, like it, my thing is to try to go a few times a year. And when I see something great up on the wall, I'll take a mental note of it. And then when I come back four months later, six months later, I go, oh, I remember that jacket from last time. Oh, yeah, I still have it. And the mentality is after three months, every important customer that they think they have a chance to sell it to has looked at it. And for whatever reason, they haven't sold it. Either the size isn't great or it has some repair problem that needs to be addressed first. And so the dealers, a lot, not all of them, but a lot of dealers be flexible on their price uh, after they've had it for a while. Because, you know, most of these stores are pretty small. They're, they're, they're really small stores. And so um, they need to move, them, move the inventory. And when their customers come in, they want their customers to see fresh stuff as well. The old stuff is sold and the fresh stuff is here. Um, and so if that happens in a, customer, in a dealer sees it and says, yeah, I can knock off 20% off the retail price, 20% off the retail price at a second tier store, plus a very strong dollar ends up being a, almost Rollsville prices and, and sometimes better, sometimes better than Rollsville prices. So, yeah, yeah the, you know, obviously, too, like not everybody is buying in California. There's Jap- Japanese that are running through middle America. Yes. Shit, right. Yes. So that's... then you got there. They, they have a more of a margin to offer you a discount. Yeah. And so let's say, I mean, back in the day, a biggie jacket size 38 was the best, best size. And a 44 wasn't very popular. Right. So I would be going to Japan buying up the 44s at some 20 percent off the regular price and that's because the japanese dealers they don't have confidence that they're going to sell that odd size so they're buying it more affordably to build in the extra margin for the risk that they're assuming so those are the things i'm buying those are the, those are the things i'm picking up again like you said from a guy who's going state yeah. to state indiana and iowa and kansas and you know town to town to town uh, are hitting local dealers who um, don't have all the, the overhead like guys in LA do, right? All the LA based dealers, they got heavy rents to pay and car yeah. insurance and all that. Right. So, yeah. So yeah, like you said, it, it yeah. all comes from all over the country funnels into Japan and then I can go through the stores and hit them and it works really well. So, yeah. And you, you have such a curated selection and Tokyo, I don't know the exact number, but there's gotta be over, 500 to a thousand vintage stores just in Tokyo alone. Osaka is like pretty similar. There's so much volume of shopping. Like it's, it would be hard to actually do it all really. Yeah, you, you can't, you can't by the way. And uh, a lot of these stores, they're owned by one guy or one company and they have 10 locations. Uh, Desert Snow is a great example of that, right? So I can't really go to an individual Desert Snow store and get some kind of good deal. Um, so I'll take a picture of that item and then contact the, the head office and say, Hey guys, I saw this at your Shimo Kitazawa yeah. store. And, but it's a, and you know, unless it's a killer deal, it's not even worth the effort, right? It's most, most cases. So I'm, I do better working with OG, uh, 
shop owners that are, you know, been in the business like me for 10, 15, 20 years. So. Yeah. And in, in the independent guys, like in Coengi and these neighborhoods that are just yes. full yes. of shops, right. And, yeah. and their stores on the main street, their stores yeah. upstairs, which is something different that we don't really have in America or Canada. Like there's high rise buildings with stores all the way up, right. Or it's like true. On fourth floor or something or, and or no, full, and no elevators. <laughs> Yeah, what for totally. and, and no and a very narrow stairs yeah for sure for sure and you can get so many stores that are um very themed out like america's kind of getting that way now with more themed out vintage but for the longest time it was pretty much vintage stores a vintage store but japan has y2k stores polo specific stores hip-hop stores yeah, true, true denim stores like there's very themed stores and you can find it's true all kinds of things that you don't get to see here so you know i've only been a couple times um not 65 like yourself but it's it's an amazing experience and i recommend it even if you're not buying just to experience it yeah for sure for sure do do you go to other cities or you strictly stick around tokyo no i go everywhere i i go as far north as sapporo and i go as far south as uh, uh fukuoka but it, I always go to Tokyo, always, always. And then I t- very typically go to Osaka. And then depending on how many days I'm staying there, I'll hit these other second or third tier cities. So also like Tokyo, awesome. yeah, Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka, Kyoto. Those are like the ones that I'll hit. Um, and then this last time I went up to Sendai and even a small town called uh, Morioka, which is even farther north from uh from Sendai, so yeah. Okay, while we're on this Japan topic here, what is your your cuisine of choice when you're in Japan? Man, Share some of your favorite it's, meals per se. It's all good. I, I like ramen uh, there. I like yakitori. I like niku, uh, yakiniku. Uh, of course, sushi. So I'm all over the, I'm all so over the board. So explain yakitori and yakuniku. Uh, yakiniku is basically like Korean barbecue, I guess. That's that's the okay. best way to imagine what it is. It's uh, the Japanese version of Korean barbecue. Yakitori is uh, basically chicken. It's like a chicken place where they roast or fry chicken. And they are famously use all the different parts. So you can have chicken liver, chicken hearts, chicken cartilage. So I'm pretty much okay. a meat and potatoes guy. So I don't like all the, like the esoteric stuff, but they sell it well, so... Yeah, burnt burnt cartilage and uh, liver and heart and all that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I go down. I, I get down on the liver. I get down on some of it, but like I'm not. I don't want to mess with like chicken feet or something like that. So <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, I'm like halfway there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But it's um, great though. I mean, okay, Jap- so, Japanese kill it on food. I mean, they're. I mean, the best it's, pizza outside of outside of Italy would for sure be in Japan. The best French food outside of France would definitely be in Japan. I mean, there's. They're loaded with Michelin stars there, so yeah. Yeah, they take it seriously, and that kind of plays into the vintage thing. It's like when they, from my opinion and my sort of limited, you know, knowledge of it, but they they just get very into and dedicated to their craft, whatever that may be. So if it's like yeah. if it's Italian food, they're going all in. If it's vintage, they're going all in. They want to be the best at it. They want to honor those things, and they want to like really showcase. It. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's true. That's true. It works. It works. So too. I want to talk yeah. about. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I want to talk about your business. Um, sure. You know, we, you know, you own now. Your business is called Hollywood Trading. Is this correct? Um, there's a few different things that I mess with. So Hollywood Trading Company is probably the most well-known brand. Denim Doctors is would I would say is the most well-known brand in LA. Um, okay. And Stevenson Overalls is a japan based uh, clothing brand that was a, a lot more active years ago and now it, it's slowed down quite a bit so it's harder to find it. you can find it at uh self edge at in portland new york la san francisco but it's not it's not so easy to find so cool uh i want to talk hollywood trading and i i want to talk denim doctor but quickly i didn't know about the stevenson overalls and it, obviously that's your namesake brand yeah is that something yeah. that you partnered with like japanese designers on yeah yes that's that's correct that's correct so yeah atsusuke tagaya so he had he was working at this uh uh belt company it was la-based belt company doing different 
doing a different idea than I was doing, but still high end and popular. Uh, from that, that her that brand kind of wound down or wrapped up, I should say. And so he came to me, said, "Hey, I'm looking for something else to do. Um, do you have any Do you have an idea?" And I said, "Well, I would love to start a clothing brand, a denim a denim clothing brand." And he was interested in it. So we were trying to figure out how we would do it, what our approach would be, and we wanted to be have our one foot in the heritage world and then one foot in like a, the fashion world. So, and see if there's a way to make that work. And the, the truth is, is it's tough to be in both worlds at the same time. Like the heritage uh, stores that carry heritage brands like warehouse or, or denim or real McCoy's, they don't really want to mess with it. And then the stores that carry fashion brands like undercover or, um, Comme Garçon, they're like, yeah, it looks too conservative or too, uh, it's not interesting enough. So it was a, it was a struggle. We thought it'd be a perfect scenario to be able to be in both stores, to be honest, that was our plan. But it, it, it was, uh, it was not as, not as we expected. Okay. So when you say that, so obviously uh, yeah. trying to get into both stores, you had to try to design where it appealed to both audiences, right? Yeah, exactly. and then when you design, try so like so, how yeah. we did that? Sorry, how how we did that? Our approach to that was take familiar silhouettes uh, and then make them in, with interesting fabric. So take a first edition jacket, but make it with interesting fabric and change the fit so that the fit wasn't as boxy and loose, but have it fit more in a more modern. So the not a super cut wide leg wide leg cut, but a more tapered cut, stuff like that. So, you know, adjusting the rise so that the the rise wasn't as super long like it might be on a pair of 40s pants. Yeah, um, totally. You know, I feel like there's there's lots of, you know, I, I guess Mr. Freedom comes to mind. Um, it, cool designs, but he takes like an interesting approach on like classics, but then like makes them his own in, a, in an interesting way or... Uh, yeah, very very similar to what we wanted to do. Uh, Mr. Freedom basically said him and I, we started almost around the same time. I think within a year of each other, oh, no uh, we started. He, he, he uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He worked with the people from Toyo Enterprises, uh, Sugar Cane. Okay. And, uh, and then Larry worked with the guys at Warehouse. So that was like the three. The three, the three guys who were doing it was Larry, me, and and uh, Chris, Christoph. Yeah, and I would say to Christoph's credit, he was the most successful of all of us. Yeah, because he's still going, and it seems like he's still putting out designs, and he's still true to it, and he very, he very much embodies it, and it seems like he lives it and appreciates it a lot. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think he's he's phenomenal. He's a, a very very cool cool guy great to hang out with and, and, and speak with. Yeah. Um, humble. So he's, he's another great interview, by the way, if you haven't done it. Already. Yeah, I actually, I, I haven't. And I know, he's, I know Christoph for sure. He's not yeah, around he's, as he's a, much anymore, but yeah, yeah, exactly. He's elusive, but uh, if you can pin him down sometime, he'd be a great interview. So obviously, you know, like you said, three of you guys were doing this. We know Larry has done it with his Heller's brand. And, you know, part of the esteem of that is that, Japan looks up to you guys as like these sort of curators, vintage, de like dealers of, of American history. Right. And, and then they want to, they, they want to use that esteem and bring it back to Japan and, and sell this stuff. So did you, was your Stevenson overalls, like you, you mentioned some stores in America, but was it also sold in Japan? And was that part of the plan to bring it to Japan? Oh yeah. Mostly, mostly in Japan, yeah, actually okay. it was sold in Japan. Some stores in Europe, uh, we went to uh, exhibitions in Paris. We went to exhibitions in Berlin uh, to show the brand. And so we had stores you know, in Germany, uh, Sweden, Switzerland, that kind of stuff, carrying the brand. Uh, but mostly, I'd say mostly in Japan. Yeah, I find it very interesting. I think it's super cool. It, it just plays into how much Japan loves Americana, not just the clothing, but also the people like yourself. They want to bring that back. And they want to be able to offer it, you know, the, the, the knowledge you have in the clothing to 
their customer base essentially right yeah that's that's fair and that's and fair. i think like it's it happens it's happening now it happens in streetwear it happens with music too like there's american bands that are like maybe more popular in japan than they are in in america right oh jack jack johnson and donovan i mean every every other store you walk into they're playing jack johnson <laughs> music so yeah he's a He's a huge, huge uh, musical influence in Japan. You know, and I, I think sure. like Sean Witherspoon is so, kind of like moving into like the Asian market and he loves Japan. He's over there all the time. He's working with all these Japanese things. So he's kind of like doing that similar thing there. And I think it's interesting. Um, but yeah, that's super cool that you did that because I, I didn't know about the Stevenson overalls, to be honest. Yeah, Hollywood Trading Company is, I would say, by the most well-known brand there's we've sold thousands and thousands and thousands of belts so there's got to be fifty thousand belts out there in the world you know in in germany and switzerland and japan taiwan singapore like that i mean there's thousands and thousands so ex explain just, explain just the, the company the, business model you know i know that you obviously sell vintage through there sure. you do leather repairs and then you also like you're big in leather goods belts wallets things like that so explain the vintage side, also the new side, how it works. Sure. So the vintage, the I credit my ex boss uh, for teaching me about leather. So he had a vintage jean store, but he would also sell great vintage American horse hide leather jackets. And um, so I definitely remember guys from tourists from Germany or France coming in and buying a uh, horse side jacket and it was like a cool thing when that happened he would also sell great examples of vintage uh, vintage leather belts just great 70s 60s kind of hippie belts or police belts or cowboy belts and uh, so when I opened up my store in the beginning I was getting belts from him he was supplying me leather belts and uh, that worked out really well it, uh, he gave it to me on consignment and as I sold belts, I came and I cashed them out for the ones I sold and got more. So he had a big surplus of belts, so it worked well for him to have the belts in my store versus sitting in some barrel, right? Um, and then eventually, like a year later, from after I started my store, a guy came into my store um, saying, oh, I know you got great leather belts. Are you interested in wholesaling them? And I go, um, yeah, I guess I would be interested in that possibly – what are you thinking? And I said, I said, you know, I'm, I can't get that many and I can't, uh, I, I sell them fine enough. So I wouldn't really be motivated to, to take the price and cut it really, really aggressively from what I'm retailing it for. And he said, no, this is amazing. He goes, well, I, no, I, I think like, can we like 10% off and no sales tax? That would be like an 18% savings to him. And I said, yeah, yeah, that would be, that would be fantastic. So he, I think I had like 25 belts on the rack, and I think he took 20 of them, or like 21 of them. Um, the ones he didn't take, I think, were too short or something like that. And, uh, and he said, great, and if you get more, let me know. And I said, oh, my God. So uh, that really kind of opened me up to how the belt business could be. Eventually, I found out that he was supplying another guy with the belts. So he was taking my belts and literally forwarding to his own wholesale customer and making a six dollar six dollar profit on on the deal um so eventually he told me who the customer was and uh, he said listen i'll tell you what i don't want to really deal with this anymore but if i teach you who the customer is and what they want can you just give me a 10 percent royalty for a year and i said yeah that would be good i'd totally do that so I paid him a 10% royalty for, for a year. And after that, then I was just directly dealing with the customer with no intermediary. And uh, yeah, the, the, that customer was buying them, paying at the time, paying more on a wholesale basis than what I was even retailing them for in my store. So that was obviously an incredible situation. Amazing. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was lovely. It was totally amazing. So uh, and then what happened was, is that customer taught me that if I ever find these 1930s belts with all the rhinestones and studs, I pay extra for those ones. 
and like a lot. So if he was paying 35 for a basic belt, he'd pay like 150 for one of the ones with all the studs and rhinestones. And so I hadn't really seen those belts out there, but then I started to look for them more carefully and started to find them. And um, they were there buying them up. So I'd buy them for 100 bucks. They'd buy them for 150. I'd buy them for 100. They'd buy them for 150. Or, you know, sometimes get them for 50 bucks. Uh, so that was awesome. And then uh, what happened from that is uh, one time I bought a belt and it it uh, it broke on me. Like it was all dried out, and so it just like fractured, so I could break it in half. So of course I was bummed because I paid probably fifty bucks or hundred bucks for it. And um, what I did is I took a plain belt with no, that had no studs on it and transplanted all the parts onto ah. this belt that was good good strong leather yeah so obviously using pincers and uh, knives and so forth to pop all the studs off and then relocate them onto the belt and it worked well it worked well and uh i transferred it onto a belt that fit me so i was wearing one of those uh 1930s style belts and i remember uh the store was called Moon Rabbit at the time. The buyer, his name was Haruara. He still has a store now called Times Are Changing in, in Japan. But uh, he saw the belt and goes, wow, you found one your size. Because I obviously I'm wearing a 38 or a 40. And those belts are from the 30s, which normally they're like 32s or 34s. Pretty small. Yeah, totally. So you go, oh, you found one your size. They go, no, not exactly. I made this one from old, you know, scrap material. And they go, oh, man, it looks looks great. Looks looks." Can't, can't tell. I go, yeah, I was pretty happy about it. So from that, I, I thought, oh, I'd like to try to make a few more. And he, and he said, look, you know, if you ever get another broken one, I'd like to get one too. And I'll, I'll take it. And so uh, eventually I found all the parts and materials and even got lucky and found uh, a, a supply house. I had a bunch of old glass, 1930s uh, glass jewels that, that go on these belts. And that was like an incredible, crazy jackpot because all the ones that were contemporary were all made out of acrylic, plastic, basically. Yeah. So, so I can make these uh, belts are very authentic looking, and uh, so eventually that guy he came back, you know, a month later, two months later, bought a belt for himself. He went back to Japan wearing it, and his staff at the store saw him wearing it. Oh my god, the belt looks amazing. We want one too. And we go, okay, well, I'll tell Zip and, you know, I'll, we'll make a few. We'll make some. So we did that. And then the staff are wearing the belts in the store. And then the customers see the staff wearing the belt and say, oh, belt looks amazing. And they say, oh, yeah, this guy in L.A. made it for us. And they go, oh, wow, can, can he make any more? And that's how my belt business started is uh, making, making stutter belts. This is before, before even Hollywood Trading Company. This is just unbranded just used leather belts with added studs sweet and um yeah that was i, I was making unbranded stud belts for like five years before i even started the what brand, year actually, was that enough, so i started the brand in 2001 and i started making the belts i think in like 95 or 94 so most yeah, of the most of the business was on. wholesaling them overseas to japan in the beginning yeah yeah, that and then uh, I started supplying Fred Siegel, the Ron Herman store on Melrose in, in Los Angeles. They were also buying them and doing really well with them as well, like really, really well. Um, it became a huge thing or I had to hire people to help me make them. So in the beginning, um, you were actually yeah. making them yourself. Yeah, uh, just 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 a couple, just a couple, two or three. Uh, that was it. And then you got some people. Once I realized, I say oh, we want we want to order twenty of them. I'm like okay, so I found a guy who was making uh, studded uh, dog collars. Nice. I you know I, I, I went to yeah this guy his main business in studded collars and studded harnesses for like pit bulls and stuff like that. And I said hey, that what you're doing there? Can you make it on a lot longer piece of? Leather? He goes yeah yeah I can do that. So yeah, that's how it started. Having him make make them for me. Yeah. Do, Eventually, I brought it in house. It got it got big enough where I just hired someone to work for me 100 percent full time. So, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So so the the current iteration of Hollywood Trading is now the brand of leather goods, which you're now making what 
wallets, belts, other leather accessories? I mean, we make leather jackets as well. We sometimes we're making denim, sometimes we're making sweatshirts. It's um, yeah, it's not always very consistent. What is consistent is the leather belts. That's extremely consistent. But on top of that, we'll make other stuff. So again, wallets or leather jackets or that kind of stuff. And is it still mostly sold through other retailers at this point? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'd say 99% of our businesses is, no, more than that, like 99.99% of our businesses sold through other stores in Japan and in Europe. Thank you guys for tuning in. That's it for the free 45 minute version of the show. If you guys want to keep listening again, join down below on the YouTube right here or jump on the Patreon and get a free seven day trial. The link is down below in the show notes. Free seven day trial. You got nothing to lose. After that, it's just $1.25 per episode. There's already five full. This will be the sixth episode. There's already six episodes of two plus hours on the patreon so jump on there thanks to zip for coming on the show thanks to everybody who's already on the patreon supporting it means so much if you guys want to shop effortsandfrankvintage.com go hit it up again we do wholesale if you're looking for wholesale if you want the easy gap for your store or you want any other staple wholesale commodities in the vintage world we got you and uh that's about it Thank you guys and see you on the next one.